Thank you, Mark, for such a nice introduction. And thank you all for joining me. I would say this evening, but I know it's afternoon for, for most of you. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you all and to share with you one of my favorite topics. Uh, it has a lot of a personal interest to me, which I will explain to you in just a moment. Um, let me just say that my talk today is based uh, on a book that uh, you can see the cover of it, but here it is also, if you're looking at my little picture on the right hand side, a book that I wrote with my mother, uh, who was intimately involved with the Cone Sisters of Baltimore. And I will explain to you how that, uh, how that happened. Um, as we move into the talk, I just could not resist at the bottom of my screen pointing out that this is 02202022, which I thought was rather a fun date to be giving this talk. So um, let me introduce my mother to you, Ellen Hirschland. Uh, this was taken about 30 years ago, uh, shortly before she died. Um, and it was an enormous pleasure working with my mother on this book. We, we just came together, the two of us working on in slightly different ways, but always checking back with each other. And it, it was a, a huge pleasure for me to do that with her. I'd like to start this story with my great, great grandparents. This is, I said, this is a personal story and it is a personal story, but it's also of immense importance for the history of art. So it's a privilege for me to be able to say that this photograph shows my great, great grandparents in Baltimore, they were both German immigrants, uh, German Jewish immigrants. And the reason uh, I show this photo to you is not only to introduce them as people, but to ask you to start looking at the room that they are in. This is a totally Victorian room with um, uh, photographs, on the mantelpiece and knickknacks knick around. I think somebody is not yet mute, muted. If if whoever that is could please, if you could please mute yourself. Thank you. Uh, this uh, Victorian furniture in the background. This is the home in which the Cone sisters, who are the subject of my talk, grew up. So it. It's a contrast to what is going to come as we uh, move forward in this story. The couple that you just saw, the, the great great grandparents, had 13 children, of whom 11 survived. Uh, there were three girls and 13 and 11, I'm sorry, 10 boys of whom, as I say, um, no, two, two of the boys did not make it. Uh, this photograph shows what the oldest of the three girls, three sisters, and this was my great-grandmother, uh, Carrie Cone Long was her name, and this little girl was my grandmother, Dorothy. That's not really part of the story, but I wanted to explain to you what the relationship is to me. The other two sisters, in other words, the sisters of the lady you just saw in the last picture, these are the two women we're talking about today. Clara Bell Cohn on the left uh, was a doctor as you can see from the stethoscope that she's holding. She was an indomitable woman, a really powerful, strong character. 
which maybe you can see in this photograph. And as the story unfolds, I think it will become even clearer. The third sister is on the right, that's Etta Cohn. And she was a much more retiring person, a, a gentle, very sensitive woman. Uh, she did not have a profession uh, like her sister Clarabelle, uh, she, but she was had an incredible intuition about art, as I will try to show you as we move along. There, among the many brothers in this family, the two oldest brothers were these, Moses and Caesar Cohn, in this photograph from 1880 on the right. Moses is the seated one, and this is Caesar. Uh, if you notice the unusual spelling of Caesar down here, usually Caesar, when we're talking about the Romans, is A-E, but this is not a typo. This is how his name was actually spelled. Now, these two brothers who had been helping their father run his uh, business in Baltimore, that was a general store that the, the father had. Uh, the, the brothers went down to North Carolina to buy fabric for their father to sell in his shop in Baltimore. And as they moved around North Carolina buying fabric in bolts, which they then shipped back to Baltimore, they realized that the cotton was being grown in North Carolina, but was being turned into clothing in New England. And they thought, this is silly. There's a lot of extra cost involved with uh, the shipping up to, to Massachusetts and other New England states. So they decided to open their own factory in North Carolina, in Greensboro, in the first instance. And they named their first factory Proximity. You can see it here on the screen, I hope. And the reason it was called Proximity was because they, were, they had the proximity of the cotton fields to the factories. And that turned out to be a really uh, inspired decision on their part. And they're commemorated in Greensboro with this sign, which you see on the left. This is one of their factories, not proximity. This is another one called White Oak Cotton Mills. It's a postcard, an old postcard of one of the several factories that they they opened. Now, uh, Moses and Caesar became quite wealthy, much more wealthy than their father had been. And Moses, the oldest of the brothers, uh, decided to invite his two unmarried sisters. Uh, let me back up and say that the oldest sister who had who I showed you with my grandmother, the little girl, uh, she married and had three children and led a kind of normal life for women in those days as a homemaker. But the other two sisters never married. And Moses, the oldest brother, decided to invite Clarabelle and Etta to go around the world with him in 1906 and 1907. I cannot emphasize strongly enough how unusual that was. Nobody went around the world in those days, but uh, this family did. And I just want to show you who's who here. Um, can you see these names as I'm showing you who's who? I can't actually see it on my screen, Mark, but I'm hoping that they show. Yes, there's Etta. Yes, they do. Okay, thank you. This is Etta, and this is Clarabelle, 
and then Moses at the top and Moses's wife, Bertha, is the fourth uh, person as, as you can see on the screen. So this foursome, uh, trap, we, we don't have a lot of photographs of that trip, but this one is quite marvelous, I think, showing them in India in 1907. Uh, probably the two sisters, Clarabel, Clarabel and Edda, learned uh, to appreciate fabrics, which were spectacular in India and in the Far East uh, while they were on this trip. It's lucky they did the trip when they did because in 1908, Moses died very young. Uh, he was about 50. So uh, it's a good thing they did this when, when they did. I'd like to take a break from looking at the Cohn family for a moment to introduce Gertrude Stein and Leo Stein. Many of you will know the name Gertrude Stein, the American writer whose most famous line, I think, is a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. Um, and that kind of writing, uh, repetitious writing is characteristic of her, her most of what she wrote. This is a portrait of her on the left by Picasso. And on the right is her brother, Leo Stein, who was probably the first person really to appreciate Cezanne and Picasso, which is quite an amazing, important statement to make. We, we get used to looking at Picasso and other early, 20th century artists now as almost household names, but they were unheard of, Cezanne as well, when Leo Stein began to appreciate these paintings and to buy them and to support the artists. Now, why am I introducing Gertrude and Leo Stein? That's because they were old friends of the Stein family they too lived in Baltimore, although they were born in San Francisco, but they were orphaned quite young and they moved to live with an aunt in Baltimore uh, where they became friends of the Cohn family, all of them being uh, German Jewish immigrants. So let me spend a moment explaining the relationships here. Gertrude Stein on the left is shown in a, an early photograph. You don't usually see her as a young woman uh, with Clara Balcone, whom you already, you've already seen this picture on the right. And uh, what most people don't realize is that Gertrude Stein as a young woman wanted to be a doctor. So she used, and Clara Balcone was teaching medicine in Baltimore, first at uh, Women's College and then at Johns Hopkins. Uh, that in itself was remarkable because uh, women did not A, become doctors usually, and then they did not usually become professors. So this is the beginning of a sense of Clarabelle's remarkable career in medicine. But in any case, Gertrude and Clarabel used to ride the tram together to, uh, to study and teach medicine, and they got to know each other very well. Gertrude and Edda had a different relationship, and almost certainly uh, they had a romantic friendship. Gertrude Stein was a famous lesbian, and uh, did not hide it in days when most lesbians were quite uh, quiet about their preferences, but not Gertrude Stein. She was very public about it. And Edda Cohn was uh, of the private sort, but we know, we now know that she uh, also was a lesbian and it seems 
that they had a very close relationship for a while. The three of them, that is uh, Ger uh, Clara Bell on the left, Gertrude Stein in the middle, and Edda Cohn on the right, met in Italy. Uh, this was not part of the trip around the world. This was earlier than the trip around the world, 1903. And you see them here in Fiesole, which is just outside Florence. It's a charming, very small town, a village almost in those days. And uh, this is, I think, a splendid photo of the three of them. Please notice the hat of Edda on the right and uh, Gertrude in the middle there. And they traveled around and together and they looked at art together with Leo Stein, who had a marvelous eye of, for early 20th century art, as I already mentioned. Now, along came another lover for Gertrude Stein. And you see here on the left, a photograph by a famous photographer, Man Ray, of uh, Gertrude here on the right and her newer lover, Alice B. Toklas on the left. And they became life partners for the rest of um, their lives until Gertrude Stein died. And you see them here in the house where they lived in Paris, the apartment uh, in Paris, where Gertrude collect and, and Leo, her brother, collected remarkable early 20th century art. And if you look at this in the lower right hand corner here is a Cezanne which is here in the photograph on the left. I hope you could see my arrow there. Uh, that painting um, is, is one that the Steins owned and that later the Cones bought. So it's, it's actually in the Baltimore Museum of Art. Now, um, the relationship of the Cones to the Steins changed because both uh, Clarabelle and Etta Cone became quite jealous of Alice B. Toklas, the new lover. Um, uh, before I proceed with that, I wanted to show you one other thing. I wanted to remind you of the home where the Cone sisters grew up with their parents and the Victorian wallpaper and the knickknacks and the cloth over the mantelpiece, all these Victorian features. And then we see Gertrude and Alice in the picture on the left, which is full of avant-garde early 20th century art. It's just a completely different setting and had an enormous effect on the two art collecting Cone sisters. I just mentioned that the two sisters became jealous of uh, Gertrude Stein with her new lover. And I, in the letters uh, that um, my mother and I studied at length, many, many letters, about 3000 letters actually of the Cone sisters that are now in the Baltimore Museum. Um, these are some of the ways that the, this is the way you say Alice B. Toklas, the correct spelling. But these are some of the variations, Taklos, Taklas, Toklas, Taklos, like a German word, and Taklos. These are some of the amusing ways that the sisters referred to Alice, whom they knew very well, they knew perfectly well how to spell her name, but they didn't like her. And I think it's quite amusing how, how they referred to her in when writing to each other. Now through Gertrude and Leo Stein, the Cone sisters met Picasso very early in the 20th century. 
he was poverty stricken. It's hard to believe nowadays, but he did not have enough to eat. Uh, he didn't have heat. He and his girlfriend, one of his many girlfriends, but one at a time, were living on a boat in the Seine as paupers. And it was extremely important to Picasso that Edda Cohn in particular started to buy his drawings, which were apparently lying all over the floor in his studio his, in, on the Seine River. And she picked up uh, a whole lot of drawings and bought them. They cost about $2 each. If you can imagine, those of you who have followed Picasso uh, will be uh, surprised to hear that. And also when she got home, when Etta Cohn got back to Baltimore, she sent Picasso, who you see here in the self-portrait, um, a whole lot of American comics, which Picasso had told her he loved. He was crazy about American uh, comics. So in order to thank Etta for her comics, he sent that she had sent him, he drew this sketch, Bonjour Mademoiselle Cohn, with his self-portrait, 1907. And Edda, uh, this, this was included in a letter uh, from Gertrude Stein to Edda. Uh, and I hope I've made this clear. Picasso was thanking her, but included this little sketch in Gertrude Stein's letter. And uh, Edda wrote back and said, please tell Fernand, that was uh, Picasso's girlfriend at the time, that she should um, have him uh, reduce the size of his tummy. <laughs> kind of a nice, amusing little anecdote. Now, Again, speaking about Picasso, this is one of Picasso's very great early paintings from 1906, from the so-called Blue Period, uh, which you see here in the Museum of Modern Art. And it's a little bit sad from the point of view of the Cones because Etta wanted to buy this painting. It was for sale in Paris and she wanted to buy it. And my mother, who you see here on the right, when she was 17 years old, had been taken on a trip to Paris by Etta, her, whom she was very close to. This is Etta in the middle. Uh, she took my mother to Paris and to Switzerland in the summer of 1936. And my mother remembers going with Edda to look every day at a dealer's uh, quarters to look at this painting. And Edda wanted to buy it, but she finally decided that it was too big for her apartment. It's over seven feet tall, seven feet, uh, three inches. And the apartment, which I will show you in a few minutes, uh, did not have high ceilings. So she figured it wouldn't fit. And sadly, she had to let it go. But I think uh, it was bought immediately after she declined the painting uh, by William Paley, who was one of the great collectors whose collection is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I'd like to introduce Matisse at this point. Not only did the Steins introduce the Cone sisters to Picasso, but also to Matisse. And as a matter of fact, both Cone sisters became much closer to Matisse, especially Edda Cohn did. They never became very close personal friends of Picasso. I think he was too much of a bohemian for them, uh, which uh, Matisse was not. I mean, he may have in some ways been a bohemian, but if you look at the way he's dressed here on the right, he's wearing a jacket and a vest and 
tie. He was kind of a proper person. They could accept much more easily. And they loved his artwork. Now there's a nice story about this painting on the left, large cliff fish. Because these are the fish lying on the ground, on the, the beach, I mean. And Edda was in Matisse's studio and wanted to buy this painting and was all set to buy it. And then she said to Matisse, oh, I'm ch I've changed my mind. I'm not going to buy it after all. And Matisse said, why, Mademoiselle, what, why did you change your mind? And she said, because those fish lying on the beach uh, will die. It's, it, they, I don't like looking at dead fish. And he said, no, no, you have it wrong. I had a small boy standing nearby watering the fish so they didn't die. And uh, that little story worked and Etta Cohn <laughs> bought the painting. Clever salesmanship, I think we can agree. Uh, in any case, uh, if you look closely at the picture on the right, this is the part, these are the fish. And this is the painting that you see on the left, uh, which is hanging in Edda Cohn's dining room in 1930. This is after Clarabelle died, by the way. Clarabelle died in 1929. And in 1930, Matisse came to visit Edda Cohn in Baltimore. It's the only time he ever came to the United States. Uh, and I think it's enormous fun that there's this picture of him, uh, which was in the newspaper, by the way, in Baltimore, of Matisse in, with, in Edda's dining room. Because Clarabelle had died the year before, in, as I said, 1929, Edda decided to make a memorial volume for her sister. And she asked Matisse, to make a portrait of Clarabelle, who, as you know, had died by then, uh, for the frontispiece of this memorial volume. As it happened, Matisse made, it, made a whole a series of drawings of Clarabelle and also of Edda uh, for this volume. Now, it's my opinion that Matisse, who knew Clarabelle very well, but remember she had died, he had no photograph of her. Uh, he remembered her, but I think he used this newspaper article that I show you on the right from 1911, which was 20, uh, 23 years earlier than uh, when he actually drew this charcoal portrait of her. I think he used this newspaper uh, photograph. This is a photograph of her, but it's not, you know, it's a sort of third hand through the newspaper. I think he used that uh, to help him draw this beautiful, I think, beautiful drawing of her that catches the strength of character that she had. Now, I introduced Clarabelle by saying she was a very powerful, very strong-willed, and had amazing guts, shall I say, in buying art. And I think probably the most astounding work she ever bought, uh, almost shocking, work is this one called The Blue Nude by Matisse from 1907. She didn't buy it in 1907, she bought it later. But I propose that even in the 21st century, this painting is not easy. And to think that a maiden lady who was in many ways very conservative, I haven't really mentioned that to you yet, but both sisters were very conservative. They wore long black dresses, for instance, uh, down to their ankles, 
even through the 20s, the flapper days when skirts got much shorter, as, as you may remember, um, they were, as I say, very conservative in dress and behavior. Uh, but Clara Bell bought this painting, which is a major work of um, Matisse. I just want to point out, not only is he painting a naked woman, but he's playing with the ferns behind. Uh, look how this curve follows her, her, her rear here. And, and it just um, sort of knocks you dead looking at this picture. Uh, I, it's unbelievable to me that Clara Bell bought it. She hung it in her one of her part, rooms in her apartment in Baltimore. And I, I was, uh, I am old enough that I remember these apartments. Uh, and I, I was a child, but you don't forget apartments like this. And um, they were crammed full of art, books, as you see the books in this case here, drawers that were full of drawings of art of Matisse, Picasso and others. And these chests here were also full of art. And look at this big book on the top. Um, the, the room was, you had to sort of squeeze by to, to get, get by the furniture. And this painting was so powerful. Just imagine how it looked in this room. Later, in the 30s, Edda was um, wooed by Matisse, who wanted her to buy this painting of a nude woman, painted in 35. He wanted this painting to be with the other nude major work, the blue nude that we just looked at. And he sent Edda a lot of drawings trying to persuade her to buy this painting, uh, which is much more modern in some ways than the previous, than the blue nude we just looked at. Look how flat this, this is a cloth that the woman is lying on. And it, it looks like something flat against the, the wall. Um, to make a long story short, Edda did buy it, and she hung it in the same room where the blue nude hangs, or did hang in those days. So this is the opposite wall, exactly opposite the blue nude. And I think you can get a sense from this picture, I hope, that with the big chests in the middle and all this, you know, books and clutter around, these two major, very large paintings were completely overwhelming. Now, I, I just have to explain, as, as I said, Clarabel had died. And after she died, Edda took over Clarabel's apartments as well as her own apartments, but she still considered this Clarabel's apartment, even though Clarabel had died by then. I wanted to talk for a moment about this beautiful Matisse, I think, uh, of an odalisque that, that is uh, an oriental woman or uh, someone from the Middle East. The word odalisque actually means a woman of the room in Turkish. It comes from the Turkish word oda, which means room. And this lady, as you can see, is wearing pantaloons and uh, decoration around and anklets around her, her legs. Uh, and if you look at the decoration, the wallpaper, the cloth here, everything is full of pattern, which is typical of Matisse. And uh, it's very flat in many ways which is again, typical of Matisse, but he has a marvelous way of giving you enough information to understand the space. 
Now he does it in two ways. One is, you may have already noticed, this checkerboard tray here leads you back with a perspective line, but still it's not clear whether this is, where is the top of this table and where is the front of it? Well, he does show us that because on the left, there is that little bit of uh, the line uh, is highlighted. Well, I have highlighted it to show you where it is. That is extremely important in this painting for showing you that the woman is sitting on a divan of some sort, like a bench, and it helps to understand the whole space of this building, uh, this room, I mean. Now let's look at uh, a few still lifes of Matisse. This one, uh, which was painted in 1895, could have been a painting from a hundred years later. It could have been painted in the 1700s. It's very traditional. Uh, it's a beautiful painting, but it, it's nothing dramatic about it in terms of modern art. But when we look at a painting that was uh, 20 some years later, 22 years later on the right, uh, you see what has happened to Matisse's paintings. So this is the one that's very traditional, pewter jug. This is another pewter jug. And it has become, this is an early work of Matisse and not the very earliest, but it's still an early work. And it shows his uh, more typical style, which is very dramatic uh, with the table tipped up, the, the, the um, plate tipped up, water in the glass. Please note that there's water in the glass here too. So that is a traditional feature to have half filled glass to study the way the water acts and how it reflects the, the plate behind it. And this is a big piece of uh, lavender colored or mauve cloth. He's studying cloth and shapes and the tipping up of the table in a much more modern way than the painting on the left. And when we go another 20 years or so, past the one I just showed you, which you see up here on the right. Um, this is a, what many of us think of as a typical Matisse, but I wanted to show you the roots of it. This is the same pewter jug that you see in the one on the, the right that we've already looked at. And look how Matisse takes the curves of that jug which were maybe even clearer in the earlier work. And he plays with those curves on the lady's robe, this woman's robe. And the, the contrast of the curves of the jug and the curves of her robe are quite marvelous. And then again, in the background, you see this flatness of the wallpaper left and right and a piece of furniture and the floor and the, or the rug maybe and a floor. Uh, the contrast of, of flatness and shapes is, is so brilliant in Matisse's work. A nice little story I wanted to share with you is this one. Um, this painting is called The Yellow Dress and it, shows his model uh, in front of a window. Again, look, this is a typical French window. This is in the south of France with the sea behind and the railing of the banister. I mean, the window is open and the window frames here, left and right, the open window, the wallpaper and the floor pattern. This is a tile floor, which he, very often painted. He loved the pattern there. So again, he's playing with flatness and space. You can see that the window brings you back into space. 
Now, there's a, Edda bought this painting in the 30s, and then she went back to Paris the following year, and she always went to visit Matisse when she was in Paris, of course. And they were very good friends by this time. And she was a phenomenal um, customer of his. So Matisse uh, was not very well, and Edda knew that. So she called him up and said, um, I'm not coming to visit you this time because I know you're not well. And he said, oh, Mademoiselle Cohn, you must come. I want you to come tomorrow. So she thought, okay, he wants me to come. And she went and he wanted her to come because he had this same model in this same yellow dress posed in front of the window so that when Edda walked into the room, she saw exactly this view that you were seeing in the painting. And Matisse had gotten the idea of treating her to seeing exactly what she had bought the previous year in real life. Now, that's the kind of relationship they had that was really out of the ordinary, I think you will agree. Now, I promised to show you what the Cone apartments looked like, other than that one room I've already shown you with the two nude figures. Uh, this is what I remember from when I was uh, a child, that when you walk down the hallway, which by the way, has beautiful oriental carpets on the floor here, uh, you felt as if you were kind of uh, slithering down past all the bookcases on the left there and paintings and drawings left and right on the wall. Uh, it, it was really crammed with artworks. And this collection that was actually two collections, uh, Edda's and Clarabelle's that they kept separately and as long as Clarabelle was alive, but then Edda decided, well, when Clarabelle died, she said to Edda, I bequeath my collection to you and you should decide what to do with it. But uh, Baltimore in the 1929, when Clarabelle died, was very conservative. They could not stomach paintings like the ones I've shown you today and many others. So Clarabelle said, uh, maybe you would consider giving it to Baltimore if the spirit of appreciation improves. Well, it did improve. And the director of the Baltimore Museum of Art made sure that it improved. And she wooed Edda Cohn uh, shamelessly to get her to give her collection and Clarabelle's collection, which by now was joined, to the Baltimore Museum of Art. And that is what happened. And that's where it is. And by the way, those 3,000 letters that uh, my mother had from the Cone sisters, uh, my brothers and I donated to the museum. Uh, so that's where, and that's where they belong. That's uh, where the archive should be, and that's where they are. I just wanted to finish with one little tidbit here. Edda Cohn, who, as I think you probably gathered, was very fond of uh, my mother, um, had this sculpture on the left made of her by the American sculptor William Zorak, who was uh, in many ways a kind of art deco a sculptor, a very good sculptor. And um, this photograph of Ellen Hirschland on the right is exactly the time when, uh, the time period when Zorak made this portrait of her. Uh, and one nice little detail to tie myself into this story, in this photograph, uh, my mother was pregnant with me. And uh, here you see her some uh, 
30 years later, uh, when the Cone collection was reopened after it had been um, spruced up and redone, was standing next to that same portrait of her by William Zorak. Uh, and if you look closely, you really have to look carefully here. She's wearing a brooch, a pin, which belonged to my great great grandmother, the one I showed you at the beginning of the talk, uh, the immigrant from Germany, uh, which her husband had given to her on what they called their honeymoon. That's after they had 13 children uh, and the smallest ones had grown up big enough uh, to be left. The, the great great grandparents went back to Germany and that's when uh, he, the husband gave her this brooch and that now happily belongs to me. And you see, this is the picture that was on the uh, um, advertisement for my talk. And uh, here I am in, in Ithaca. I'm not in Ithaca now, as you know, but um, that is the same brooch which my mother gave to me uh, before she died, which I'm very honored to have as part of this story. And on the right is, again, this head of Ellen Hirschland in the Baltimore Museum in uh, reconstruction of the Cone apartments, which they have made. And it's, it's rather fun that this portrait is there. Um, I also have in Ithaca, and I'm glad to show you if I ever see you again, those of you who are watching from Ithaca, uh, I have a beautiful purple robe, uh, sorry, blanket that belonged to Clarabelle Cohn, uh, which I was showing when I was giving a talk in Ithaca one time. And it really uh, is typical of the Cone sisters. Here you see them again, Clarabelle and Edda, in those long black dresses that I described with lots of um, really dramatic jewelry. I remember Edda wearing a huge Renaissance pendant on her, on her uh, bosom just like this string of bring, uh, beads that you see here. So when you think of these women so conservative in their dress and their behavior, buying those unbelievably modern paintings for the time when they lived, it really uh, shows what a dramatic uh, taste they had in art and how that has become one of the most important collections of early 20th century art in the United States. Thank you very much. <laughs>